And he goes, right there. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, that's a mistake. And he said he begged John Lennon to do another take. And they did. And John Lennon said, are you happy? And he said, yes. He goes, great, we're using take one. <laughs> of course, of course. The first time I met John Shanks, we were both performing at the Cleveland Indians baseball stadium for 80,000 people. He was playing with Melissa Etheridge, and I was playing with John Cougar Mellencamp. That was September 2nd, 1995. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame concert for the Rock Hall. And everyone from Springsteen to Bon Jovi, John Fogarty, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, Hart, Melissa Etheridge, the Allman Brothers, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Sheryl Crow, Bob Dylan, Chuck Berry, and the Pretenders from Ohio, and many, many more were performing that night. Now, the next time I met John was six months later at AM Studios in Hollywood, where he was co producing and playing guitar on a Melissa Etheridge record in Studio B while I was in the back room recording with Rod Stewart in Studio D. Now, the cool thing was weeks later, I was asked to record drums on that Melissa Etheridge record with John and then went on tour with her and John for three and a half months later. I continued to make records and tour with her and John for many years, but John eventually stopped touring to focus on his songwriting and producing. Listen, the bottom line is John loves being in a band. I mean, he's a band guy. That was always his dream, just like mine when we were little kids. Now, today, he tours, co-writes, and produces records with Bon Jovi when he's not writing, recording, and producing records with other artists and bands. John is a six-time Grammy-nominated songwriter, a Grammy-winning producer in 2005, and also a guitar player, of course. He's produced and or written 43 number one hit singles, 86 number one hit albums, and sold over 60 million records. People are lucky if they sell 600 records now. Some of the artists he has worked with are Melissa Etheridge, Lance Morissette, Michelle Branch, Joe Cocker, and Rod Stewart. Glad to say that he had me play on those records. The Doobie Brothers, Keith Urban, Santana, Fleetwood Mac, Robbie Robertson, Take That, Steven Tyler, Cheryl Crow, Celine Dion, Miley Cyrus, Sting, Van Halen, come on, and Bon Jovi, of course and literally hundreds of others. John, I mean, you'd love to do it all. You like to write, record, produce, touring, all of it, and different styles of music. But it started with your desire to play guitar in a rock and roll band like the Beatles and Led Zeppelin first, right? And that how it all started? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, growing up in New York, my uh, I'm the youngest of three, and uh, it was the records between my parents, what they were playing in the front room, and what my sister and brother were playing in the back room. So, and my room was in the middle. So I was hearing, you know, Hair and Frank Sinatra and, a, you know, uh, the Fantastics and Man of La Mancha and, and, and uh, all the, and Streisand and all this, you know, the Broadway and uh, the American Songbook in the front room and, you know, Cole Porter and all that. And then, and then, uh, you know, uh, Revolver and, uh, I mean, it list goes on, you know, I remember vividly hearing Elton's first record or Cat Stevens or Cream. And, and it was interesting because there was, there was always something, cause I was listening, I was always listening. And so there would be something that would, you know, perk up my ears and I would walk down the hall and what is this? Oh, sweet Judy blue eyes. Okay. Got it. You know, um, so yeah, so there was a lot of that music in the house. Um, there was a piano in the house and there was, a uh, an acoustic guitar, which I would play piano. My brother really played piano. I mean, it was classical oh, yeah. and went to Juilliard and I was like, I would kind of sit down and listen. I had big ears. I was always listening and playing records and sitting between the speakers and changing the balance and you know, with Beatle records and going, oh, wow, the drums are on one side or, you know, I could, and started to figure out harmonies and just as a, like a toy, as a kid at four and five, you know, grabbed a tennis racket and was pretending to be, you know, John and Paul and George and uh, bouncing on the bed, singing, you know, meet the beat, you know, the meet, 
first few Beatle records. I vividly remember that and bringing that to school and jumping on a table, you know. The tennis racket? Well, the tennis. I, I, anything, anything that was this. So, and then what happened was uh, when I found the guitar, um, I remem remember seeing uh, the, the Stones movie, the Altamont movie, the get, you know, the Get Your Yaya's Out record. And that movie and seeing Woodstock and uh, Monterey Pop, those movies, you know, those, that's all we had visually back then, unless you could go. Yeah. And um, that seemed, those were profound influences on me because I could, uh, you know, see, oh my God, that's a, what is that guitar? Or what is he playing? Or Alvin Lee, you know, and all these. And I was like, oh, what is that red guitar? Or what is that, you know, wood guitar that Keith's playing? Or certainly song remains the same. I mean, I went to see it in a theater, you know, multiple times. No internet back then. No. So, you know, we would... You know, and there was a commercial that would advertise a Kiss concert. I would just, you know, I was like, okay, it played at 326 on a, you know, and so you'd sit and hopefully they'd run it again. And, and uh, you know, it was just this beginning. And, and listen, my, my father at the time worked at ABC and uh, would bring home ABC Dunhill records, you know, free records and a lot of those, and plus others. So... The first Steely Dan record, I remember, and 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 Albert King, BB King, and some of that was in the house already. But you know, when you hear Live at the Regal, BB King, and 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 you know Albert King, you know Cold Feet, and you start, you know, so I was like the blues, and and, and I was just and Lightning Hopkins for acoustic wow. blues stuff. Um, I just Jimmy Reed. It was like. Oh, Jimmy Reed was so important for me because it was, you know, in E, first position, boom, 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 boom. You know, so when you're, you know, 11, 12 years old and you're trying to figure that out, I was like, okay. And then that's it, off and running with acoustic stuff because we had that. And then eventually saving up uh, um, to buy a, a Strat. You know, at Manny's, no, I went to Manny's, but there was a teacher at my school at the time who said, you know, they're having a sale at this other store and $237 <laughs> was a, it was my 76 natural strat that I Today it's at a couple of, it's probably 3, 000, 20, zero. Yeah, $3,000 for that guitar or 3,500 or what, you know, but I stripped it and then I eventually put a humbucker pickup in it when I moved. How old were you when you did that? 14. Oh, you 15. were already doing it. See, that's what like, like a Fogarty. Five-way switch, you know. Eddie Van switched. Halen did that. You guys were like scientists. But I did the humbucking thing when I moved to LA, you know, when I was in, so that was now 11th grade. So I played single, you know, the stock yeah. strat. Who influenced you to do the humbucker thing? Was that it like. It was kind of. Jimmy it, Page or. I think it was, it was the idea that. You know, when you play a Strat and you use, obviously, distortion pedals or a little delay, which I got was like a memory man. I remember I got my memory man and an electroharmonics like a big muff or something. And you get a lot of ground noise. You know, obviously, you know, so you're in your little apartment and you're trying. Great thing about those two pedals is that I could, you know, play along with records in my room, but play it really quietly. Oh, yeah. So while everyone in the house is sleeping, I'm playing, you know, David Bowie live. Or, you know, song remains the same, or the earlier Zepp, Zeppelin 1, Zeppelin 2, and play along with them, um, but really quietly, as quiet as, so I played, so I wouldn't piss anyone off, really. So um, the humbugger thing obviously came later when I was like, oh, this bucks the hum, this gets rid of the hum, and so that's, that's why it's called a humbucker, yeah. you know, it was right. like, oh yeah, right, you know. Did you like? I mean, I mean, New York City was so vibrant, you know, on so many levels. You, I just had this visual, you know, the piano, the thing. Your parents probably had cocktail parties, and all kinds of interesting people came through that. You know what I mean? They're smoking cigarettes back then. Because my, my, I grew up three, you know, hours out of the city, and a lot of the New Yorkers, because my parents were New Yorkers too, they'd come up, and it was that scene, and I was thinking. This must happen every day in New York. You know that. You know what I'm saying? Well, and my, your dad was at ABC. Yeah, your my mom was, well, my dad before that had produced the Merv Griffin show, so he was the executive producer. So 
his job was procuring talent, you know, going to all these clubs at night and finding these great up and coming comedians and, and, and uh, singers. And so, you know, he would have these big parties at our house and it was, the, you know, the comedians that were there, it was pretty staggering. And, you know, I remember meeting Dick Gregory and, you know, George Carlin and uh, uh, Dick Sean, and it was just endless. And then there was the, the singers and, there was always someone in that crowd who was an exceptional piano player who could play any song. And they'd all sit around singing show tunes and, you know, drinking and smoking. It was the Mad Men era, you know, era, which was great. You know, it was it was insane and toxic, <laughs> inappropriate <laughs> most of the time, you know, but it was um, of course. but it was also exciting. There was something for me, it was like I that sound of you know, the hum of people and music and, and, you know, um, enticed me. Time to go to bed, John. I don't want to go to oh, bed. Yeah. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night or for me, the middle, and they'd be going at it. And I would just lie under the piano. I just sit there. Yeah. And, so I was like with my, you know, I just remember sitting under the piano and listening to these songs. And wow. so, yeah, that's a big influence. Everything you said, man, is like, First of all, it sounds like you came into life with this curiosity because when you started to, at that young, you know, switching left and right, you know, I mean, you already had in you, but you, all of it came together. But now, like today, though, I mean, like, this is a tough question. I hate when people ask me this. Today, is it touring or the studio? I mean, you like both, right? You've got to like both. You know, it's funny. I was having a conversation with a friend on the way down here, and it's today, it's today like today today like yeah. being in the present moment you know yeah. and not worrying about touring not worrying about what's coming up or what what i've done or where i'm going and you know and uh of course i watching the wheels comes on the radio the john lennon song and it's like that's the perfect song to you know for to express that in the sense that you know detaching from it all like mm. you know what does it all mean you know That's and true. so for me what it all means is you know i'm trying to get this place of it's doing nothing in a sense where it's it's kind of i know it's i'm getting zen here but it's in the sense the more i do nothing then i'm staying out of expectations i'm i'm, I'm not worrying about am i going to get mine or you know then i don't get to fuck them yeah. <laughs> you know i don't get if i'm staying in the moment and in the day and then i'm you know what are the expectations or planned disappointments you know so the the less i'm worrying about that session coming up or the writing thing or what's going to happen to the record or what's going to happen you know with the uh, uh, the tour and so you know so then when i do show up because you have to show up you know <laughs> that's about life you yeah. know you have to be pre you know you have to sh be accounted for yeah. and responsible you know in what we do yeah otherwise we wouldn't be d been able to do it as long what's the point <laughs> well but also people are counting on you yeah but then you know listen you and i in a sense are in a service business you know you you know there's the joke where, you know, sometimes you're just the tambourine player. And then the, the joke is, we'll play the shit out of that tambourine, <laughs> you know, be the best tambourine. Player. <laughs> so a lot of times our job is to show up and not, you know, sometimes facilitate a, a session or a writing session or, or be of service to that person, you know, so be a healthy conduit, a good, a catalyst to bring out the best in that person. And you and I, we've literally been on stage together where we're supporting an artist yeah. we've been in the studio where we've got their backs so they can fumble and fall and make mistakes and we're like we got you wherever you want to go that's what producing is you're not only doing that it ain't about you it's not about as i say it's not about me it's about we i mean you have to deal with the artist and each one is quite different and that's your talent. I've seen you in the room, you know, but you're dealing with every musician. Everybody in that room is the best at what they do. And you're the guy, you have to step out of yourself, but you're not a pushover, never a pushover. If you push John Shanks, he's going to push back. But 
you always that was you were meant to be a producer because you know how to serve. You know, you, and lead. You're like a team player and the team leader. Well, there's times to push and there's times to let things flow, you know? So um, I can do a lot by doing nothing at times. And then, you know, you realize that it, it's, it's, it's interesting because now it's m my studio that we're, I mean, most of the time. And, um, you know, it's, you don't want to waste time. But what's interesting about songwriting or making records, you know, when things start taking a long time, it's because you see people's, I don't want to say bullshit come up. You see their insecurities or their fears. And, and sometimes it's really important to, especially now, you know, we're not on tape anymore like we used to be. So that was a performance. We had to be like on. Like, where do you want me on the click, you know? And yes, there, that, there is a bit of that still time. Time is so important, you know, where, the, how you push it or relax on it. It's, but the, the other thing is giving somebody um, the dignity of their process, but also moving it along. Because, because of digital recording, you can overthink something to the point where nothing happens. Or <laughs> I see people, they're like, well, you know, and I'm like, it's a hard, we can mute it. We can erase it. Go for it. You know, dare to suck, dare to dream. You nope. ever have anybody go like, well, can't you fix it? Well, yeah. But you can't, as with tape, we couldn't, especially drums. Oh my God, the pressure is like, you, got, you really need a full take. He can do a few fixes, but with Pro Tools. Listen, I've had it where the click is going. I was recording this band in like in the '90s, and I'm and you're and 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 someone would the drummer would stop, but the band is. I'm like, but the click is, and it was a great take. I'll let the cowbell go for another two minutes, and he's looking at me through the guys like, I'm like, no, my buddy, <laughs> we're gonna punch in on this take. So I'm like, sorry, we're gonna keep going. And because there was a beautiful energy that was happening and he got into fear and a doubt. And just because he missed a fill, you know, I remember talking to Keltner and he, he said, well, if you listen to the last fill going in to the last chorus of whatever gets you through the night, I make a mistake. I drop my like stick and I yeah. fumble into the fill. I'm like, there's no way. He goes, yeah, listen to it. I go, I've heard that song a thousand times, you know. And sure enough, so I sat with him and we played it. And he goes, right there. I'm like, oh my God, yeah, that's a mistake. And he said he begged John Lennon to do another take. And they did. And John Lennon said, are you happy? And he said, yes. He goes, great, we're using take one. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> so, you know, there was something magical that happened. Yeah. So yes, the idea of Pro Tools, but you know, yes, I'm recording three of your takes. And then we quickly, you and I go in the room and we go, and you go, you know, I really like the fill going in and that, maybe that fill. And we just quickly, it's boom, 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 move on. You know what I mean? Because you're an instinctual player. You know the song. We Maybe we played it a couple of times. And, and then, then once you get it down, then it's the idea of, okay, execution, you know? And I, I'm guilty of it too. Again, again, let me play it again. And you're... Because you're developing a theme, you're developing a sound, you know, and sometimes um, whoever the engineer is recording, you know, I can't worry about him, you know, I'm like, oh, sorry, this is taking too long, or I'm sorry. It's like, no, our job is to play it well. And, and, and as I'm playing this, whatever this is, after we've cut a basic track, so either there's the quick fixes that the bass player makes or that I'll make as a rhythm player or, um, but I, I I'm going to jump away from that. But my experience is that the, the times that the singers, male and female, whoever, the soonest the song is written and recorded is the best because that's when they're emotionally connected to the lyric that is when it's present on all of our minds or the singer's mind. 
Um, if you use like, have a nice day, I'm just going to this Bon Jovi yeah, song. Yeah. That was the day we wrote that song is the day he sang that song. First cut is the deepest, Cheryl Crow. She's like, we should do a cover. Okay, let's go do it. When? Now, right now. And then acoustic guitar, mandolin, a little drum beat, sing, sing, sing. Excitement sing. That's the day she sang it. That's perfect. We got it. And so, I mean, there's the climb, Miley Cyrus, boom, you know? So the soon as you can get it down, the better. Okay, what about this now? How do you, I remember you calling me, telling me, I'm like, are you friggin' kidding me? Van Halen. Now you're dealing with some real complex, you know, it's a band. It's not like an artist. It's a band. And there's obviously a lot of complexities in the personalities. You're a fan. Eddie Van Halen, top three guitar players of all time. How, uh, Hendrix and him reinvented guitar. Who does that? And you, 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 you're just in awe of them as a fan. But you're the producer. How do you negotiate and how do you deal with, what's the process of dealing with that complexity? Well, you find out what their uh, routine is. You know, you find out what their uh, work ethic or work, work routine is. And those guys, Wolf and Alex and Ed would rehearse. They were, I mean, they would get up at uh, like 5.30 in the morning. It was crazy every day. And they would run through songs up at Ed's house at 5150. And so their work ethic is, is, you know, you, it's always like, why is somebody that person? Yeah. <laughs> Cause he's up before you playing every day and, and stays up later too. Yeah. But they were real. It was interesting. They were morning guys. Mm -hmm. My experience, when I was around them, they were morning guys. And so when we went through, okay. So how it started was, uh, I said to Ed, like, He's like, well, I want to take some old songs that never got finished, songs that never came out, rework them. You know, the pressure was really on Dave, you know, in a sense, because he was writing new top lines to all this, some of this music that had, that had been around for a minute. Some were new, but some were reimagined. They were all reimagined, but, you know, you know how fans get, they're just like, it's yeah. like, you know, they get, they, they, you know, they love to go on the internet and fucking yeah. talk about this shit. Especially that band. That's an easy target. Well, in the sense that like, oh, that was, that was from, you yeah. know, the Starwood 77 and it was down in, down in diapers and it never came out. And this is thing and you can't touch this. And it's like, you know, where any great songwriter always takes stuff from other songs that maybe haven't seen the light of day. I do it, you know, like, oh, I didn't use that line in that song lyrically. I can that'll work here or a lick, you know, well, that girl and her record never came out. Right. I like, that's my lick. Yeah. Sorry. You know? So, um, with those guys, um, it was fun because initially Ed came to at the time my house <laughs> and we, with a shoe box, you know, the, I think he got some of it from Dweezil and, uh, some of it, uh, he had, and they were dats cassettes, CDs and we sat there and we played um what's called uh, I call it Smasher Trash, you know. Right. And I was like, this is a great where's this? Yeah. Oh, this is in David Parents House basement. I go, what are you playing through? A basement. Oh shit, this is great. You know, but that's a good lick, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah, well, that turned into this and that thing. So it was great for me as a fan yeah. to go through the history. You know, you can't look at it like you're sitting there with you know, your, your, your guy who had, you know, you had a, my, his poster on my wall, you know, I mean, I remember buying the first record. I remember, you know, attempting to do my homework as I'm listening to eruption. I'm like, well, I'm done here. <laughs> you know, it's, guess guitar is the way to go, you know, <laughs> and just thinking that I wanted to be somehow a part of that. And, and, um, uh, we'd never heard something like that, you know, and which was interesting that, you know, this kid who was 12, 13, to think that years later that uh, Ted Templeman, who produced all those early Van Halen records and the Doobie Brothers, that there's only, we're very, we, he, I talked to him on the phone once and he's like, you know, you and I are in a very exclusive club. Yeah. I'm like, what's that? He goes, 
the only two guys that have produced Van Halen and the Doobie Brothers. What a contrast. That's my whole point. You, you, um, you and got, I was like, wow. So different, you know? Yeah. And, but not when you really get into listening to the Doobies and, and understanding them and dance the night away, all those harmonies and the way they're stacked and you go, oh yeah, there is a thread to some of those Doobie stacks. And and, and maybe Ted brought some of that to it, you know, or uh, Pretty Woman or just the way he, because he was in a vocal group, you know, Ted. Oh, I didn't Like know. an association kind of man. Yeah. And, and I think that's what okay, I... Okay, that makes sense. So you go, oh, okay, there's a lineage. Yeah. Now, you know, are those guys going to want to say, no, we're unique and we're our own thing and that was our thing? Was... Yeah, but maybe that's why he was attracted to them because they were so developed in at the Starwood when he saw them before, when they got yeah. signed, you know, when he started to work with them. So anyway, back to, so the record, the idea was getting this material, but then um, th they, they would come in, like you could set your watch to the, those three guys. Cause they would every day at 11 and we tracked for, you know, we were working for months. But they would come in, you know, so it was kind of in, we started in like January. So they'd all have the same exact windbreakers or park, little park as it was really kind of endear endearing because they come in like, you know, heckle and all looking the same, the three of them and like, like a team, like three, a, Eddie, Alex, Eddie, and Alan, Wolf. And they'd Wolf. come in like just like, <laughs> talking, chatting and get behind their you know, Alex behind the drums and, and, and I'm, Ed's here, Wolf's here. So I got to, for six months, basically sit in this, uh, beehive with them. And Henson, did you do yeah, Henson? Studio D, D where you had done yeah. that Rod song you were talking about. You know what? I, I, I don't mean to interrupt you. I just did a, a show with uh, Sammy Hagar and that, you know, people make fun of me because they read charts. Cause I'm, I'm always, I, I can't memorize 50, I'm juggling 50, 80 songs with different acts. Anyway, I said to them, I mean, I have to play it like Alex. It's like, why would I do something different than what John Bonham did on those Zeppelin records? And that's, to edify what you're saying, that's what Sammy said. Those guys, Alex and Eddie, would rehearse for a week. Yeah. Every single part. Then I would put my vocals on top. So all those cool little drum fills and that little quirky thing. I'm like, wow, why can't I think of that? Well, he spent a whole week. Absolutely. And finally came up with that cool little yeah. thing, you know? I mean, listen, Ed's a legend, without a doubt. You know, he's one of the greatest guitar players of all time. Ever. Okay. Al <laughs> is one of the greatest drummers of I all totally time. I totally agree. He said something really profound one, one night. I said, so what, what, what happened? How did you... Because didn't Ed play drums and you played guitar? I flipped it. And he said, well, the, the difference is when Ed picked up the guitar, he made music. I was like, okay. You know, because I just played guitar. He made music. Now, they both played piano, or I think Ed played piano, obviously, too. But the idea of, there were moments recording. Now, they're playing the same song over and over and over. We're recording all, you know, but there were moments where Ed could literally, they were looking at each other through the glass. Ed would lift his shoulder, like little, like just go, da, 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 and he'd move his shoulder. And, and Al would play off of him. Like he knew, it was like a, tra like he was like, you know, it was like this zen. I almost cried one day. It was so beautiful. The DNA and, and, the, and how locked they were is, and the love, the love between them, it's, it still makes me want to cry. They were, it's so, and Wolf, and they were supportive of Wolf. And so then you have this, right? This beautiful connection with these guys. And then like any band, there's the singer. <laughs> <laughs> and we've worked with a lot of singers. And singers are, you know, there's that great saying when Springsteen's talking about 20 feet from stardom. And you and I have stood next to a lot of great oh, yeah. musicians. And, but Bruce says, let me tell you something. That's a long, lonely 20 feet walk. <laughs> 
And it's true because I've stood next to Melissa and I've stood next to Rod and I've stood, stood next to Bon Jovi and we've stood next to a lot of other artists and they are unique and there's a gift that they have that's, that's, it's so hard to pinpoint what it is exactly. There's a charm, there's a talent and there's a gift. And Dave, you know, has that gift because he had to sit there and write all these lyrics and if you really listen to A Different Kind of Truth, Dave's work on that record is exceptional. I don't care what anybody says. I was there. You know, that's the, there's a reason it's called A Different Kind of Truth, because everyone has their own opinions yeah. that nobody really cares about, you know. Yeah. But I was fortunate and lucky enough to be a part of it and there. That's incredible. And so to see his work ethic, all of them, all of them, Ed was trying to come up with a solo one night and he, and, 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 and he, and he's like, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I can't get it. He goes, let me take, just can make me a, just make me a CD of the solo. This is uh, Ed. Yeah. And, and he went home and I, and he came in and usually you gotta go, so uh, how, how'd it go? Or how'd you do? Or Santana's done that too. I was with him once and he said, let me take the solo home. And he called it going to the church. And he has this place in his house where he goes and he sits between at his altar of truth between Coltrane and Hendrix or whoever it is. Yeah. And he develops the solo and they tell him what to play or Ed some. And he came in with a worked out, uh, beautiful solo, you know, and it had uh, like this beautiful arpeggiated motif in it. And it was, you know, it was, and, and, and Carlos came in with, uh, he said, I said, how'd you do? He said, well, they told me what to play. Wow. Miles, Miles and Coltrane. He's real spiritual. Oh, yeah. incredible. You know, and it's not like you sit there and go, oh, yeah. You know, you go, oh, what? Yeah. I get it. Yeah. I get it. All right. Well, well, do you remember the, your first band, what the name of it was? Yeah. What was it called? <laughs> my first band. I'd say my first real band was called Line One, which was at when I was at Beverly Hills High School. And um, so not New York, so you didn't have a band? No, that was more like little acoustic showcasey kind of stuff mm -hmm. and go down and rent space. And those rehearsal places in the 30s. And I played on a couple little hip hop records that actually, you know, which is every once in a while I'll go, oh my God, that's me going dig it, dig, dig it. You know, like why did Africa you, Bambata something or how did, what made you go from New York? Cause New York was still happening. Well, my family moved to, to LA. Oh, they did? Yeah. Oh. So my parents, my, my oh, brothers. I didn't realize that. Mm. But so I was a jun middle of my junior year in high school. And wow. so my dream was to just get into a band and, you know, study guitar, like, like take lessons and so, and do sessions. You know, there was that era where, you know, you, I looked up to Carlton and, Luke and Jay Graydon and those guys and Buzzy Feetin and like, how do you, how do you, I want to be those guys. You know, you'd just comb these records, you know, back when they had credits. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you'd see this guy produced this record. Oh, wow. That's the same drummer from that record. Right. And, you know, I mean, the drummer from Low Down is the same drummer from, you know. Jeff Rico. Yeah, it was Picaro. It was like, you're like, Lee who's Sklar. this? And who's this? Who's this Lee Sklar, you know? Oh, yeah. And who, who are these people? Well, who's that funk? Oh, it's Buzzy Feetin. Mm -hmm. Who's who's the other guitar player on that Stevie Wonder song? Oh, it's Jeff Beck on the right, and it's Buzzy Feetin on the left. Yeah. Who's the, who is this guy? Oh, he played in this band. He came in. So you could, but you had to really work hard to find out who these guys yeah. were and, and are. And, um, and I've been doing that ever since. I, I still do it. It's like, who's this guy who played on Lenoir's record or who played on this? And how does the edge get this sound? How does so-and-so get this sound? What is that? An Omnichord? Okay, cool. You know, yeah. put through a what? A memory man and a SCD. See, that's the same thing you were doing when you were a little kid going left and right. Yeah, it's it's, it's, in, it's your brain. It's a curious, it's a curiosity. When did you, when, when did you start writing songs? I started writing probably at 14 or 15, but I was too shy to play anybody my songs. You know, they were more very James Taylory, folky, Cat Stevens-y kind of songs mm. because you know, I couldn't record. It was pre Porta Studio. I mean, I eventually got a Tascam Porta Studio 143, which changed my life. What were you using? What were we using when we were on tour? I'll never forget that moment. We were on tour 
The sun is sort of, or dusk is coming, it's, or sunlight's barely coming. We're in Italy, and we're listening to Rage Against the Machine. They came up with, was it that second record? Yeah. And was it Audio Slave? No, it no, was, it was Rage. Rage. And you, did you have an Akai out there? You were doing all kinds of writing. MP, MPC, too. I had an MPC. Right. And you could... So I was sampling and right. creating grooves, really. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah. Well, grooves... Uh, well, I started with a Tascam Porter studio and then a, a Dramatics drum machine and then a Juno 60 and, and a, you know, and a, and, a, and a 57. You know, that was like, and, a, and then I got a Spring Reverb and then I got a, a Fectron Digital Delay and then I got a DBX 160 compressor. Like you just, I just kept like, mm. so, and this is when I was like 18, 19, delivering pizzas and, you know, playing on people's demos. And, but every time I, you know, I was still living at home and I would buy gear, you know, and, and it taught me about counterpoint and taught me about sounds and recording and layering. And of course, my songs are, sort of, <laughs> you know, by the time you finish, you know, yeah, those right. four tracks, bouncing them down. The you Beatles. Know, you know, you start. How genius that was. You kept brightening it. So by the end, you know, so you start, I don't know, it was, it was very helpful. And then eventually getting a better drum machine and then eventually many years later, getting a sampler and an and MPC and learning how to. Um, you know, I mean, I could sample that little drum break from there or that snare sound or that thing and mix it with this. And so I, I, I was a fan because it was mixing hip hop with acoustic, anything I could do, anything that inspired me, whatever it was, some kind of sound. So, you know, yeah. whether, you know, even massive attack and mixing it with, you know, hip hop. And I remember you out there, man, you turned me on the Dortmunder or Dortmunster. Kruinder and Dorfmeister. Yeah. You turned yeah. me on to that stuff. You were like, wow, check this out. I, I, but it's I, also Eno, you know, I'm a yeah. huge Eno fan yeah. and I've, you know, because for me, you know, ambient music is, is so important for me personally. Ambient music is so important because it has nothing to do with a chorus or, or, you know, a hit single. It's about an emotion and a mood, you know? When did you think, wow, uh, I can do this or wow, I'm actually good. When was your wow moment? Like, I'm actually good. You I'm haven't still, gotten there I'm yet. Still... You're not there yet. I knew you could say, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? When you go like, wow, I can actually do this. I'm, 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 I'm not bad. Listen, there's moments where you're doing it and you're doing it for fun and for free. And occasionally you get paid and you just keep showing up and you, and you, you're not gauging how far you're, you've come. You're just woodshedding, you know, it's like learning a craft, you know, you show up and every time you show up, you're learning something, you're learning something from the producer from the, the other guitar player on the session or the, getting to work with certain music drummers or musicians and and not not that you're not a musician <laughs> not yet, but, <laughs> but the idea yeah. that you know working in a collaborative setting you you start to go oh i want a little of what he has or what she did on this and i started seeing that working with different producers like he's so good with singers mm. he's this guy always has food <laughs> coffee keeps the energy going Keeps it light, keeps it fun. This guy's drum sounds. Mm. This guy's how, you know. So I would be, as the guitar player, after we would track back in the day, I, you know, I would do overdubs. So you got the chance to sit with the producer a lot of times. And I would ask, I was that guy. What's the compression ratio on Intruder on Peter Gabriel's record? And Hugh Padgham would go, 10 to 1, you know, and walk off. And I'd be like, 10 to 1, 10 to 1. See, that was that inquisitive mind yeah. that from day one. That's how it's you learn. It's not like I'm, um, I think it's really important to come from a place of humility, you know, and curiosity. And mm. it's not like I'm stealing the information so I can compete with you and stamp you out. Some people come from that place. I'm not into that place. That what, bores me. What would I do if I said to you after, let's say, a Bon Jovi concert, I said, do you think you were great tonight? Do you have a hard time saying yes? Well, I had, there was, we were playing some place and some friend of mine came backstage and I'd had, I'd made some mistakes or something didn't work. It didn't, didn't work. It didn't work for me, yeah. you know? And he's like, God, you were, you were, man, you were on it tonight. I was like, no, you know, I, I missed this thing. And, and he goes, 
hey man, that's your problem. (laughs) You know? Exactly. That's your shit. Your shit. shit. Right. It's your problem. He goes, I loved it. You were great. You know? There it is. And he goes, you have to remember, this is what the other thing he said, he goes, you have to remember you're a cog in the wheel. You're part of the collective. So it it ain't about you. It's about supporting the artist. And you guys as a unit were fantastic. So nobody cares that you and the third bar missed your like double stop gunslinger <laughs> it's like he's right do you think yeah, uh, he was you know, right this, i mean tom brady seven super bowl rings he could sit there and say well i did this wrong did that he's got seven super bowl rings he's doing something right right so but so for me there was the one of the moments you know that you think of these profound moments in one's life and one was certainly i was we were doing a Melissa record and it wasn't going well. I was just the guitar player. I never, this is really important, never crossed the boundaries. You know what I mean? I never went to Melissa and said, I write songs. I should produce your record. I'm, you know, I know, you know what I mean? It's a very different mentality nowadays, you know, and I, and I, it's, you know, what is songwriting and what is producing? Because there's many records, and I know there's records that you've played on, where we've come up with big hooks. And nowadays, they think that's songwriting a lot of times, and it's not. You oh, know? So you're clear about that. I'm saying, did you write the lyric? Did you write the melody and the chord changes? Well, you know, you're hired to show up and do a job. And so if you happen to write the hook line, that's your job. Right. And as the producer... Is that the way you look at it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now there have been about t- these, some of these rap records. They got 50 writers on them. One guy came up with the snare sound. One guy came up with the bass sound. One guy came up with two words and they're all, you say written by, and it's like a, looks like a Bible. Yeah. Well, this is a, this is a, this is almost, you can have a panel about this. Okay. You yeah. could because, um, well, depend- someone's allowing that. Well, it, you know, are they sampling something? So that's one thing. Oh, that's so then, so that's fine, you know, and, I'm not a big fan of committee songwriting. You know, uh, I've been in uh, fancy lunches where, you know, I've been told by executives like, well, you know, we had a, a, a songwriting camp and we had this track we liked and we had, you know, 15 writers come in on it and write verses and choruses and melodies. And then we picked and choose what we were. That's, I, that's great. That's cool. If that's your thing. That's not my thing. Mm. I'm in the, the artist. I'm, yeah. you know, I'm just not there. I'm just not there. And and listen, I there was a period where I was really like, cogn, you know, cognizant of playing, trying to write hit songs, and not that I'm not aware of that when something feels like a single or feels like a hit. You know, you you know, what songs do you want to play for people when they come in the room when you're working on a record? If you say like. Hey, this is X person's record I'm working on. Hey, let's play them, blah, 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 blah. It's usually, those are kind of the, the, the catchy songs, which is fine. Or they rock. Or sometimes it's like, it's, you know, check out the lick on this. Or check. So I'm jumping around. But, you know, the idea of um, what is songwriting, um, I still come from a bit of the Nashville thing, which is, you know, if it's three people in a room, it's thirds. If it's two, it's 50. Right. You know, and... So when you get together, let's say, with Michelle Branch, you guys, are, she's got a song, but you, together, you... But we've written, it's like with John Bon Jovi or yeah. Keith or whoever I've written yeah. with, you know, there, that never really comes into question. Oh, that's great. That's cool. I mean, and if you're having those questions, yeah. stick around. Yeah. You know, because... And I've gotten into it with artists, you know, pretty big artist where all of a sudden all, back in the day, I used to call my manager and say, I know what they think the splits are. Right. 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 And they come back. Well, 75, 25. Oh, I'm yeah. like, yeah. Yeah. Because I don't doubt that your worth, you're not, our worth is equal. Meaning yeah. that you and I are both putting in 110%. And if you and I are writing a lot of songs together, that's why Lennon McCartney just split everything. Yeah. Yes, John mostly wrote that song. Or yes, Paul wrote that song. And, you know, but they were a team and they made that decision. So if you're, 
want to have a relationship with somebody and a good run with somebody, it's just easier just to go, because you know what? I could be hot on Tuesday and crappy on Thursday. Right. And you could be hot on Thursday, but you and I are writing. And, you, and, and so if there's this dialogue, yeah. you know, then we're going to bring out the best in each other and believe in each other. You yeah. know, like, I, I, I'm at 20% today. What do you got? Well, I got some. Like, and then you don't have to think about it. If you're thinking about that, I got, I got, I got to be careful. Here, but this is okay, Celine Dion record. I won't say who the songwriter was. This guy was the song. He wrote the song all by himself. I don't know about the lyrics, but he wrote all the song. Maybe he wrote the lyrics and he was producing it. She got 50%. She wasn't even in the session. Yeah, well, that's... that's you know whole, what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a whole and, other And that's thing. probably her manager, her husband. So I remember me having that conversation with Well, that's guy. where somebody like a manager said to her at some point, hey, you know, you're not making as much off your records as you could. Right. But if you start taking publishing because it's kind of like the toll. You're, you know, all these artists, songwriters are paying a toll fee to get a cut on this artist's record. Well, she sold 40 million and, copies. And at the time, you know, I mean, I worked with Celine yeah. and I was at, I came after that. So she didn't do that to me. Right. And there were times where I wrote songs for her and then there were times I produced her. And um, a gem, she was a, a funny- Oh, I bet she, she is was. still, she's yeah. amazing. Well, this guy, I mean, it was, I mean, so let's say you get seven points per, per song. He got three and a half now because he has to give half, but because he's producing, he gets another three and a half back. So he's getting his seven points. And who? I meant who the, the songwriter producer. And so, it, so it, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and I remember him calling me up and going like, what do you think, man? Um, and uh, cause he was thinking of making a move where he was living where the tax rate was very high. I said, I think you might want to make the move because move to, to, to move a place where else? taxes taxes on his bed because my point was it, we, we were kind of doing them uh, he wanted me to help him do the math because if you get a two songs on this person's record and it's going to sell i was just guesstimating 27 mil you you know you're going to do really well and if you know might you might consider making that move you know what i mean my point was that yeah some people don't know a lot of these type of details but that well, there is a difference obviously between writing and publishing and producing yeah I don't want to say the reason I wanted to produce was that by, okay. The thing about producing is that there's a budget and you get an advance as a producer, usually, yeah. you know, whatever the, the amount of, you know, who knows what the, but you know, now it's singles, you know? Yeah. So let's say we can give you this per as an advance for the song. And then there's a budget on top of that. Then there's my, what my, Fee, my fee, my points, credit, all that. Now, let's say I wrote the song and it's you and I wrote the song. That's a whole other side of the pie. Yeah. But the, the thing about producing is, you know, while you're waiting <laughs> for the songwriting money to come in yeah. to through ASCAP or BMI or whatever, or mechanicals from radio and how much thing it has earned, how do you survive? Well, if you're producing, you get a fee. So it's this yeah. dance that starts this revolving door of, you know, well, I'm producing this, so that pays my bills. And, but, oh, and then here comes this money. Right. And so that, for me, was, was really helpful for a long, uh, in the beginning, when I, when I started getting calls as a producer and a writer. And then what would happen is some albums, you know, I only wrote like four of the songs on the right. record, but I produced the whole album. Right. So you get advanced, you're waiting for the publishing. Yeah, I mean, it's... Now, what about today, though? I mean, all that stuff is so much less because nobody buys records. Well, you know, we let the cat out of the... You know, we, unfortunately, we didn't protect ourselves, you know, with streaming and, yeah. you know, this is the Who's big... we? Well, us songwriters and producers and... You think you could have protected yourself? Well, I big, think it was so home? new that nobody, they were... Nobody knew what to do. But the or labels, the labels well, made the lab out. They this, made out. This is this is one of these conversations. Um, <laughs> the people people disappear about, you know. So I mean, yeah, but it's the idea that look what's happening right now: the writer strike, 
for all the oh, screenwriters yeah. and you have uh, all the actors on strike. Because what happened with the actors is they gave away cable years ago. Mm. So if you had a national, I, mean, I know I'm talking TV here yeah. or actors, but you know, if you'd get a national commercial spot as an actor, you'd got paid a lot. Yeah. But they were buyouts on uh, cable. So you weren't getting the residuals. You, you probably, yeah. because at the time cable was tiny. Yeah. It was HBO and maybe yeah. Showtime and no one, there was pre TNT and all these other channels. And now there's a hundred of them. Now they became big. Right. So there, it should be, and, and in the music business, it's a similar thing. Yeah. You know, remember with DVDs, you know, you, you know, you had to, the movie, movie companies held on to that. They held the line longer than the music industry. And what happened with the music industry is unfortunately when streaming became what it became is that quickly all the labels made deals with Apple and Spotify yeah. so they could continue to stay in business. And unfortunately, the writers and producers of those records got the short end of the stick. Yeah. And that's still what's happening. So when I would write a song, you know, let's say on a Bonnie Raitt record in 96, and it was an album cut, I could make, I could survive yeah. as a writer. Yeah. You know, I was like, I'd make a good chunk. Well, she was selling records too. She, you know, but yeah. So let's say she sold two, three million copies. L sold. Sold. Like sold. people bought it. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and I, and just having, being so grateful as a writer to, or Joe Cocker or Tina Turner to get those opportunities to, as a young writer coming up. And you could, you, you felt there was a sense of pride. And when you would get your first publishing deal, which I, in, in, in 90, I got my first publishing deal, oh. you know? And for me, that meant, wow, I don't have to be a production assistant. I don't have to deliver pizzas. Yeah, yeah. I can just play on records, write songs. And I felt supported and I was put in rooms because of having a publishing deal with other songwriters. And I learned my craft, you know, because you got to write a lot of bad songs to write a few good ones. I remember a, sh a sh pivotal, two pivotal moments close, maybe in the same year or close to, and it was with you. And it was the Michelle Branch record. And this was where it was flipping, where it used to put everybody in a room and you got to get the drum track and you built everything on top of that. I remember coming in, I think it might have been at Sunset Sound. Yeah. And I'm listening to these tracks and they sound finished like finished and so i you know my drum techs would set up my drums and we're going and we're having to f really do some work to get the snare drum and the kick drum to sound right because it's got to fit yeah. sonically around you know you have three guitars and stereo you got background vocals you got the main vocal you got bass keyboards loops and all this stuff so we spent a long time like took the front head off the kick went to a smaller kick put an ambient mic in front anyway I'm getting a track. I think the song was everywhere. Getting a track, and I'm like, oh, I got it. I look in the in the room, and there's nothing going on. I'm like, uh oh, something's wrong. I take my headphones off. I walk in. I go to you. I say, is is uh, is there something wrong? He says, you tell me. I'm like, oh my God. go up. I show the engineer. Give me the click in the drums. Okay, okay. Give me the loops click in the drums. Okay, something's not. I sound laid back. And I said, so give me the acoustic rhythm guitars. Lou on top. I look over at you and you're going, yeah, it's me. I said, I got it. I go out there, take the, the click down, get the loops out and play to your tracks. It was not bad. It was just that you were leaning, which created an energy. And that song needed energy. Mm -hmm. It was that killer chorus. Mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I played your... It's always the guitar player, Rush. Now, when you looked at me, he says, it's me, right? I says, yeah, but it's okay. And... The point is, I actually went, wow. Now I'm going to fast forward that year. Wait, wait, let me just say one thing. So the reason you're, you're great on so many levels, but that's a very important thing that you just brought up because you didn't come from your ego. You were a team player and you said, you know, and I was like, I'm sorry, the loops got there first. <laughs> so yeah. you got to play to these loops because everything, even though I'm rushing, is built off this thing. Right. So that means the kick pattern has to be this. I'm sorry, you have to be a bit of a machine, but I want your I like fills it. and I want your energy and I want the sound of the room because I want it to rock more than it is. You know, I want to find that high, that space, but it takes a, a certain kind of musician, like not, I'm Kenny Aronoff, kid. 
You didn't treat me like I was a kid. So I'm you never going to be that me. guy. You, you know, you were very, and that's why you were the perfect person in that situation because you you helped me. I almost got run. You helped me. Wow. You know, well, I didn't you, realize I was helping. But you. And listen, I've been in situations where there were <laughs> other drummers. Yeah. And it was a similar kind of vibe where this, it was built off beats yeah. and loops and and um and they just kind of played, you know, like, hey man, I'm blah blah blah. And I'm gonna give you what, you know, this is what I'm known for. Yeah. And you can suck it, <laughs> basically. Yeah. And so I've there was one time I had I does and we're, he and I are friends, you know, and I and I went out there in the room and i said hey um because the artist was in the room and said are you going to tell him or am i going to tell him and, <laughs> and they were like well you're the producer <laughs> mr producer you go out there and tell him so i'm like great i have to here comes i have to go in the room and here's a guy i really you know like yourself i really respect yeah. and admire and i said listen the whole song is built off this kick pattern yeah you gotta, you gotta play it you gotta play it and you know me i write everything out and then and then he the guy went Okay. Didn't do it. I went out a second time. And I said, I know our time is limited. I know you have to leave soon. And I kind of leaned in and I said, I can do this with you or without you. <laughs> and that was really a scary moment. And I didn't want to be that guy. But, you know, sometimes I love you, that you that guy. Sometimes that, you have to yeah. be that guy because it's, it's the, great because it, it's about the song. And the song needed that energy. And we had worked hard to get it to that place and thought about the kick pattern and thought about the, 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 you know, the syncopation and all the grooves. And I said something else to this person and he was like, I got you. And he, of course, it nailed it. And I was like, well, now was that so hard? <laughs> yeah. you know? Well, here's what I'm leading to. So if you remember this, this is infamous in my recording career and you and i did 13 songs oh, yeah. in one day yeah eight alanis morissette's two anastasia uh uh melissa etheridge which became an incredible song it was like a hillary duff song Hil it was, uh, a hillary... It was hilly on that one but uh, it, my memory is better than mine but it was a uh, a, something you'd done with Johnny Resnick from yeah, Goo Goo Dolls. Dolls. Maybe a demo or something. Something, something that might have been, was hopefully going to go to Gwen Stefani. And I might, that might, it's, it was something song, but yeah. 50 songs. I was on tour with Michelle Branch, flew from Philadelphia at 7.30. Well, you Atlanta. only had a day. That's the reason we that's did it. That's it. But here's what I'm getting at. So then I do, everything's written out. I remember, we were in Studio D. I come in, I'm there at 11, 11.30, we're going. I remember Studio I, B, but that's and okay. I, Maybe it was Studio B. And then I fly back that night to yeah. New York to do, like, some morning show. The point is, well, it was great. Oh, it was so great. I remember laying all the charts out and laying on the floor like, oh. You took a picture every time. Yes, yeah, like, right. But here's I, the, I found those pictures. Not here's the ago. point. This is when the budget started to change. Yeah. Well, we had to do it in one day because it's, of the budgets. Exactly. That's the point. That's what I'm trying to say. So... People who may not realize those rooms are like two and a half grand a day, roughly. John, you had a room in, in Henson. You had your own room. You could work up all these, and you, your work was impeccable. Get all the songs ready with drum machines. What's his name? Was an incredible programmer. He was a drummer who could program it. Okay. And then you wanted to get the natural, raw thing to take it to a you know, pop rock level that worked great on radio. And you, you made your mark with in that time, the Michelle Branch thing was this high energy, but yet pop, girl singer, real radio friendly. It was a major touchdown. But for me, I'll never, for me, never forget, it was during that same period, Sherry Sutcliffe calls me up, the project coordinator and says, hey, Kenny, are you available to do this session in two weeks? I said, are you in town? I said, yeah, yeah, no, just fly me in, like always. Mm. Budgets were changing. And it was that time, and that's when I realized I got to move to LA because oh, right. you, you can't, That's I had, right. I had drums, New York, Nashville, LA, right. Indiana, of course, where I lived, Germany and Japan. I went, you got to be in town. Yeah. That's why I came here in this studio right across there where my drums are. It used to be your guitar locker. Right. And I, I went, I, the budgets have changed. Yeah. I saw that the whole game was changing. I'm overdubbing drums over. So when John says, I need you, 
Uh, there's no budget to fly you. You got to be in town. Yeah, but there are guys like yourself and guys that, like Victor and Drizzo, yeah. Abe Laboreal Jr., you know, the guys that came up playing in bands and understand that, you know, um, there have been plenty of times where we're in a room and I said, like the, when you're talking about the Goo Goo Doll song, for example, I was yeah. like, you know, this could be the record. This is where we just wrote this. Mm. And can you play on this? Play, play. And you don't differentiate between, a, a, it's all a record. And that's the way I think of it. You know, the demo is the record, the record is the, you know, it's all connected. So um, as long as we keep track of it, you know, because sometimes that demo will end up being the record, you know? And, and so people like yourself understand the process. And where people and you so you don't get all like well you know i played on that demo and you never got paid or da 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 you know it's like those, those you know that, that that shit doesn't fly much you know so the people that are kind of understand the process go you know like victor a lot of times i call him up and i'm like you know i just wrote this song today you, where are you he's like yeah. i just left a session i can come by yeah. and the kit's set up and yeah. he comes and rolls in and yeah. we either track it live yeah um or he plays on top of it and i and i write down victor played on yeah the you know scooby-doo song or yeah. some song and that song became the single and i make sure that he gets paid what he should be paid if it, was, to, if it when it becomes the regular you know if not i definitely owe him a lot of sushi you know and take care of him as a pal yeah. and we get to be together and we hang because we're friends yeah, you know yeah, yeah. and so there's a bit of that and though and the guys that get that especially with budgets changing and the word, the way the world is, you have to come from a place you do it because you love it, you yeah. know, and you have to have that idea that you're doing it for fun and for free. Otherwise, you know, if you're always looking for the results and the outcome and where's mine, that's yeah. not a good place, a spiritual place to come from. Well, it, it, you got to look at the big game, the big picture. You got to think like, you know, do I want to be in this business? You know, but how much do you want to chase the carrot too? That's a whole that goes into the back to the you know the writing and this producing and trying to have hits constantly. You know, a good song. You know, the, Bill Leopold, yeah. Melissa's man, used to say a, a hit song cures cancer. <laughs> you know, meaning like you know, just do the work. And a good song will will move people. Yeah. You don't have to convince people when it's a good song. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what genre it is, if it's country or pop or rock or whatever, you know, whatever your floats your boat. A good song is you're moved. There's an emotional connection, whether it's the melody, even if it's the the most trite pop song, look you look for the look for the good. You know, people spend so much time like, well, I hate that guy, or I hate that yeah. song. Or I would never, I'd never do that. Well, okay. You know, I think it, for me, it was really important to work with young artists and career artists. And that was always my dream. You know, yes. Do I want to work with the up and coming singer songwriters? Yes. Michelle Branch. Well, that was that, you know, she was 17 when I met her, you know, and what's interesting is everywhere was uh, an idea she st had started and nobody liked it. Nobody liked it in her camp. And they were like, don't worry about that. Forget that idea. And she goes, you know, they don't like this. What do you think of this? And it was, the melody was different, but the idea for me that you're everywhere to me, so simple. Mm. But as a songwriter, you're like, you're everywhere to me. I get that. Yeah. You know, when I close my eyes, it, you're all, you're all I see. Wow. You know, I mean, it's, so it's like who can't relate you know, to that? We did. We sat. I said, I, this is what I said. I said, give me an hour. Mm -hmm. Let's rewrite the song. Are you okay inviting me into your song? That's number one. Yeah, of course. Are you going to get all like? And she's like, no. This, otherwise, it's not going to happen. Smart. So we sat and we stripped it down and we uh, wrote the lyrics and and wrote the chord changes and i said you got to go to the chorus needs to lift so and she was a she worked with me i worked with her oh wow, that's and, great but that's you know she sure. was like that john bon jovi's like that keith urban is like that there's a song i wrote with natasha benningfield mm -hmm. daniel brisbois and it's it's pocket full of sunshine yeah it's it's a very poppy song 
But what's funny about the story of that song is we got together to, to work, to write. It was a session. We spent all day writing a very professional song, right? And I was nervous about the session. So I wrote her this piece of music before she showed up the night before. I did the track, basically. To, of that song? Of that song. And with the little keyboard lick, the acoustic guitars, the drum beat. And I thought, you know, this, maybe she would go over something like this. We're at the end of the day, done with the professional song. It's now six o'clock. She's got to go to another session in Malibu. And, and we're talking. And I say, um, we're talking about kids, cancer, homeless, hunger. And I said, you know, it'd be so great if you just had this like pocket full of sunshine. You could just like, you're cancer free. You're not homeless. Here's food. Here's love. Here's sobriety, whatever it is, spirituality. Yeah. And she's like, oh, that's such a great title. We should, next time we get together, we should, we should do that. She's never coming back because we wrote a good song. We didn't write a great song. So I play her. I go, you know, I wrote you this track. You should, I want you to hear it. She's like, John, I've got to go. I'm like, just fucking cranked it <laughs> and she comes up behind me and she goes i got a pocket got a pocket full of sunshine and i turn her and i go i got a love and i know that it's all mine and we both went yeah oh yeah i was like you have to go sing that just 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 go sing that and so she went out in the room with her coat on. To that track? Did to you play track? it? Yeah. yeah. She, she, so you like, had it on that track. Yeah. So we had it. Just, totally makes sense. Good move. Sang it. Cell phone's ringing. What, do, what do you want to eat at your next session? Blah, blah, blah. It's in Malibu. You got to get going. I was like, double it. Double it again. Sing it again. Now sing a harmony. John, I have to sing it again. Go. Oh, okay. So we built up this. We wrote the chorus in real time. Everyone's like, ah, she's got to go. Not thinking, not, you know, just having fun. And then just like, oh, we need another section. I'm like, uh, take, take me away. <laughs> a secret, a better place, a secret space. Take me away. <laughs> Sing it. <laughs> what? <laughs> Hurry, go, go. Number one song. You know, and, Dude, and, I, and I said, I said, you know, what's going to be really funny because it's all hooks. There's no verses. There's no like, you know, yeah. I got to, you know, and, and I was walking down the street and I found a penny and I picked it up and I put it in my pocket and it turned into a dollar and, and that dollar I gave to somebody else. And then they bought food and they got a new job. And it like this trip, like, that's what I was thinking verses, but we turned it in with no verses. Brilliant. And I said, we're going to get the call. She's like, no, 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 we're not going to get the call. We get the call. You know, we've been listening to this song. We love it. I'm just using this song as a metaphor for all songs. Of course. We get the, we get the call. Okay. There's no verses. And I thought, there's no verses. I told you. <laughs> so we said, okay. And we wrote all the verses. We wrote all, all these verses and she sang them. And it's not the same. The song is like when the song came out. It's like refresh me with the verses in. No, the, so the verse I'm getting to the punchline. Okay. So, yes. so so called up the head of the label. All the ad, promo people. They're like, say we'll, we'll play you the verses. We'll sing it to you over the phone. <laughs> and God bless her. She, she we played it to them over the phone. They were like, ah, oh, thank you. That's great. We love it. She goes. That's the first time and the last time you will ever hear those verses. Click. Hung up. We were like, whoo. So the version that's out there doesn't, there's a version somewhere that's never been released that has verses, but it would have diluted the, the, the I, simplicity I get, I totally of the idea. So the idea of going back to whatever song we can think of, you know, all the way back to Michelle or Joe Cocker or Rod Stewart or Melissa or Alanis or Cheryl, it's like there, there's the hook. There's the simplicity of what that title is. And, you know, because I remember there was a song I wrote with the guys in Take That, and it's called Patience. And it was a, a, a big hit, one song of the year at the Brits. Yeah. 
and I met Lucian Grange, you know, who runs Universal. And he goes, he comes up to me, he goes, hey kid, that uh, patient song, love it. That's all he remembered was the little falsetto hook and the title. And I thought, you know, great. You know what, you had to yeah. mercy, like, someone could say, nah, you know, you, when you were presenting a song to a label person and you got some A&R guy who wouldn't know a hit from nothing, and you had the mercy of them and what they're going to do. I've uh, listen, Right? There was a song I did, uh, I'm going back to a long time, but it's, it's uh, Pieces of Me. It's an Ashley Simpson song. And I, and I really oh, liked I that. I think I was on that, right? Yeah, you played, you played on that. And I really liked that song, you know? And it was one of those songs where I kind of felt, I had the title, I knew what I wanted, I, the melody, I kind of knew what I want. But I knew the idea with the way she sang, you know, pieces, pieces of me, that it's like, you know, that same thing where it's just the repetition of the title and, and the big m melody and the payoff of the chorus and... And then it was like a, a, a collective lyrically, the, a team working on to making it, honing it in and making it great. But we, I, we fought for the melody, you know, and, and at the time she was like, I don't know if we should. I was like, no, we got it. And I said, give me this song and then I'll do whatever you want on the rest of the record. Oh, I just that. felt that strongly you, you it. about it. Yeah. So at the end of the night, printed a mix for the car. Right. Mm -hmm. So through a TC finalizer, it was a rack mounted unit. Uh -huh. That's all we had back then. Yeah. 2000. I don't know. Oh, we used to go into cars and listen to it because that's what people are going to listen to right. so their I, songs on. For the, for the end Radio. of the night, I was like, just give me a, a mix for the car. And we kind of mixed it in 15 minutes. And, and I went in and just what you were saying, I went in and played it for Jimmy Iovine. And I played him the four or five songs we had been working on on the record so far. And it was the classic, all right, you know, good job. Thanks for coming in. You know, come back when you have the single. And I said, I played you the single. And they're like, oh, oh, really? Which one is the single? Song two. I put it there for a reason. And then it was like, well, let's listen to that again, shall we? And I went, let's go. Now, it took a lot of guts to say, I played you the single, it's but I believed album. in the song. Yeah. To his credit, to his credit, he said, listen to it once, listen to it again, listen to it again, oh. and, and maybe a fourth time. Wow. And he turned to me, he goes, you're right. And he goes, how about this? I'll go even one further with you. I went, okay. He goes, first off, I didn't really appreciate the song because the first song was such a rocker. Sonically, it kind of took me a while to settle in it. But if I hear this individually, it works. I get it. Thank you. You know, good job. And um, he said, you can do whatever you want, but that's the mix. And I'm like, Jimmy, <laughs> no, that's, that's the car mix through a finalizer for the car. He goes, kid, you can do whatever you want, but I got that. And that sounds like a hit to me. And that's what I'm going through. So enjoy yourself, go back. And I did, I, he's like, go mix it again, go do it again. And what ended up coming up? <laughs> His version, of course. He was right, Yeah, he was right. That's incredible, no kidding, okay, let's jump into Rod Stewart. We did this record, it was that yeah. classic, you know, was it still the same, the, the great rock, rock classic. So it's all hits, you know, a bunch of them, like Bob Seger, uh, you know, The Pretenders, uh, you know, um, John Fogarty, all, it all hits. So you're not writing any songs, but it's Rod Stewart. You and I both, as kids, you know, like, oh, my God, Rod Stewart's, you know, the faces. Oh, my God. And I Rod played in his band. I know. You played in his band. I remember you telling me. I'm like, are you kidding me? What's well, that you know like what to me on stage? You and Ollie and Oliver and, and you're in Rod's band. And, you know, I mean, he's a rock star. He's like, there's a few people out there that have been rock stars for 50 years. Elton John, you know, yeah. Rod Stewart. I mean, and now you're producing them. And I was there. Thank you for inviting me. Studio B, Henson, with this incredible band. Yeah. And the thing that blew me away, because yeah, I was I, Dean, I heard, Dean Parks, Tim Dean Pierce, Parks. Lee Sklar, Jamie Mahobrick. Uh, uh, and, the, and what's his name? Uh, the keyboard player, Matt Rollins, was there too, right? Maybe. I think it was mo Jamie, mostly. Oh, was? And then it was, Lee Sklar was there, definitely. It was the, you, the rhythm session was you. You didn't play guitar in it. it was, I it, did. 
I put, but I not room, not always win the track. Steve well, Parks and and, um, and Tim, Tim, yeah, yeah, it was incredible. And uh, uh, but I trust I, me, I played guitar later. Yeah, of course you <laughs> did. But I knew that Rod doesn't like to sing because when uh, that funny story, which I gotta remind you about, but I remember that Rod wouldn't sing in sessions. He just and then you got him to sing in this session, but they covered up they covered up the glass, so he didn't have to look at it. Yeah, I don't think he wanted. He could see me, but he couldn't. He couldn't see, see you us. Guys. But it was incredible. I mean, for us and that I, and well, because some of them, I'm hearing his voice. Yeah. I'm playing. It made me play differently. But he had to get comfortable with you guys. For a minute. I understand that. Well, he got comfortable with me because we were joking about his manager basically yeah. subsidized John Mellencamp because when, when he he had a manager called Billy Gaff, and if you wanted John, if you want, you had to take John Cougar on a on a show. We don't want John Cougar. Well, what if you get Rod Stewart? If you get Rod Stewart. Well, you take John, you, have, you can get Rod Stewart, but you got to take John Cougar. So Rod made a big joke about how he felt like he helped John Cougar become John Mellencamp and have mm -hmm. a career. But anyway, he was great, man. But that that's, what's it like working? I mean. Well, the interesting thing, so I'd played guitar for him for three, four years. Oh, before that. With Rod. Yeah, so he already knew you. He knew me. But. And when I left, but when I left the band, I, I remember the moment I was before Christmas at one point and we were playing Earl's court and I walked into I, and knocked in his dressing room and I said, do you have a minute? And he, and he went, no, <laughs> he knew. And I said, I think I'm going to stay home in February. I'm not going to go back out. And he was like, why has something happened? And I was like, no, you've been amazing. And, uh, uh, but I want to, I really want to stay home and write and produce. And he went, really? <laughs> yeah, you know, like good luck with that kid. And you know, no, he was cool. He was supportive. He got it. And well, look where you end up producing his record. Well, that so the irony is, um, I had been working a lot with Clive Davis at the time, doing Kelly Clarkson and Santana and uh, somebody else for him. And so he was like, "Do you want to?" I'm thinking of doing this because he had such success with the songbook, right? And he wanted to do the rock right. book, which was really interesting because we would, there was a very funny moment where we were meeting at the bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and we had everyone had their like Billboard top number one songs of all time, and we were going through you know the '60s and '70s and trying to pick number one and, and Clive, it had to be a number one. And I was like, no, 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 this song, oh, it's number three, can't do it. I'm like, Clive. so there was a moment where Rod's in the room and a couple of A&R guys uh, and, and, and Clive and the door to the, the door to the suite is open and Elton walks by. Wow. And they have pet names for each other. Wow. Like Denise and Cla Clara or something. Oh, yeah. So in English. So thing. English, right? Yeah. You know? And he leans back into the room and he goes, Darling, is this how many people it takes to make one of your records? <laughs> <laughs> and then kept walking. And Rod's just like, oh. it was genius. That's amazing. So we finally got, you know, there was a couple songs that we, you know, they wanted us to do that we had to put our foot down and say, no, we're not going to, you know, because it, it, it's not appropriate for Rod to cover. Right. It's, it's too close. It's a peer. You know what I mean? It's too similar to, yeah. um, it's like he's not going to cover a Stone song. Right. You know what I mean? Right. So, I get it. So, you I know, totally the musicians in the room had to be like, no. Yeah. And Clive would respect that. And sometimes Clive would have an idea and you went, oh, that's a, that's a great one. You know, um, we did that bread song and, and, and at first Rod wasn't into it, but then I said, the song was about his dad. It's not about a relate, a, right. a, a love interest. And when he realized it was about his dad and he calls it being an orphan, he lost his dad. Yeah. He, he loved the song and father and son. We did. Father and son we did, yeah. The version of father and son. Yeah. But the, the, the first day of him walking into the studio, he comes up to me and goes, aren't you glad we ended our relationship amicably? You know, that we're still friends. That's deep. Because who would have thought 10 years later, you'd be producing me? 10 years. Ten, was it 10 years? 10 years later. That was, yeah, it was 2000, what was it? It was at least maybe almost 10 years. Yeah. 
and he was fantastic. He's in, in oh, he was, and it's a great, and it's a really good record. And really I cool. felt very lucky and privileged. We did a Joe Cocker record together too. Oh my God, respect, right? Yeah, over at uh, uh, no, we did it in D. We did it in D. You're right. We did. That was handsome. Oh my God, well, and that I went on tour home. with Joe Cocker. I mean, it's like right, <sighs> which we you know, of course. So when they say, hey. You know, for Fogarty, hey, do you want you need, you should try this guy Kenny? He played with Cocker, yeah. Rod Stewart, yeah. Mellencamp, Elton. He's like, oh, okay, yeah, bring that, yeah, bring that guy. Yeah, let's get that guy. You know, you know, I, I got but that's th one of the funniest stories I'll tell people is I'm walking. This, I'm going to record with Rod Stewart and D and putting it all together here. I fly in from Indiana or wherever. I land. I come busting through the door at at, at A and M back mm, then. I remember. And, the, and you're you, there's you. I met you from. Yeah, we met a couple of times. It was at the the Cleveland thing. Yeah. There's you and Hugh Pageant. I come through the door because I got to run back. I'm late for the session. You guys start laughing at me. I'm like, yeah. what? And you took it personally. I took it personally. <laughs> We're like, why are you laughing yeah, at me? And and I said, We're looking for you. <laughs> well, you didn't say it right then and there. We were off. working on a song, right. and you were co-producing with Melissa. I was with you. Yes, and okay, okay, and uh, I'm trying to think if I was producing that record. You were co-producing. Co anyway, and, the point is, yeah, we were like, you know what this song needs? We need a drummer like, you know, Kenny Aronoff. And that's when I walked through the door. And we and we were saying, yeah, you know, I wonder how we can get his number. I wonder, because, I, I, you know, I think he's in town a lot. And we walked in out into the hallway and you were literally walking down the hall. That's funny. That's why we were laughing. And, and, then and he, we were laughing pretty hard because you, we, no, this he, was like a five, 10 minute conversation. We know, oh, no, do you know him? Do you know how to yeah. Dude, it was And like, then Lee came behind you, Lee yeah, Spar. Because he was going back with me. Yeah. But here's what happened. You didn't say what it was. And I'm still wondering what's going on. And Hugh says, hey, can, do you, can I have your number? I'm working on a record. I might want you to be on it with the Melissa record. But, it, you know, what's fascinating was that night at the Rock and Roll which Raw Hall of Fame, which was a oh, historic dude. night. Historic night. I mean, everyone was there. Everyone. I was on a, a, a bench on the side of that. I was on the bench for eight hours. In those we, bleachers? Yeah, you yeah, and I, right. eight hours. And we were watching everybody. Everybody. And there was one moment where Melissa kind of goes like this to me. Yeah. And she goes, and she goes, look down, down the, the row. And it was, <laughs> it was you, me, and Melissa, but it was Dylan, yes. Springsteen, Jackson Brown, Jackson Brown, uh, Bonnie Raitt, Bonnie Raitt, uh, uh, yeah. So James Brown, uh, uh, Chuck, uh, Chuck, Chuck Berry. Um, it was just like Chrissy Hine. Yeah. It was, uh, Bon Jovi. Yeah. Who I didn't really know. I met him that night too. Really, I bumped into him a few times. Yeah. So the irony that all our paths would yeah. intersect and cross. And I've I've known Jackson since I was eighteen or not, yeah, probably eighteen or nineteen. Always been really supportive of me as a writer, as a producer, mm -hmm. and would used to call me on the phone. And you know, I heard that record you did. Good job, kid. You know, keep going. Like keep going, kid. And I'm like. Now, if the 14 year old me said, okay, so Jackson Brown's gonna call you <laughs> to give you support, or that I would go from playing guitar with Melissa to, to collaborating with her and producing her and writing songs together, what changed my life, you know, I'm gonna jump ahead for a second, is um, when I ended, what, there was a situation where it was like you and Pino were in, was in the room and Pino kept telling, pulling me aside and he said play it cool mate by the end of this day you're going to be producing this record and i was like wow and i go pino I yeah he's tall yeah. yeah so i look up <laughs> and, <laughs> and i go you're crazy he goes i've been here i've seen it just play it cool stay in your lane wow. and he was such a big brother to me like you've been you know and and sure enough she pulled me in the back by the dinosaur in the back parking lot at Hanson. And she was like, John Shanks, would you produce my record? <gasps> yeah. And that record, we got like four nominations, best rock song that she and I wrote. Your little secret, right? No, it was a uh, breakdown. breakdown. And break, that one, that record, right, so that, after your little secret. Yeah. We were so. getting in the loops and stuff yeah. and yeah. all kinds of, remember I'd make all these, Mishmash you had your pony. We called it the pony. Yeah, the kick drum with the fur on it yep. or something. We did all kinds of mishmash and create a whole loopy thing and then play to that. 
Scarecrow. But, but but she let me do it. Yeah. She gave me the support with and budget had a great budget. You know, yeah. at the time she was coming off. She, you know, I'm the only one and. We don't come to my window. She was on fire. Huge. And, and, and we would sell out 15,000 seats sometimes. When we we went on... from opening for Sting at the Garden to headlining the Garden, the Garden two nights, you know. So, you know, if anyone should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it should be Melissa Etheridge. I agree. So um, she paved the way for a lot of other female artists that are now uh, accepted and loved and adored. And Melissa paved the way for all of them. And I've seen Melissa turn water into wine yeah. in front of audiences. Dude, I saw yeah. you guys perform at the at, at Cleveland. So I wanted to go back and look at that. Yeah. That oh was my, a, she was dressed in leather. Yeah, she we were all in leather. You you had this, the headband. Yeah. You guys were kicking. But she was one of the great. And I, I remember she doing, was great at Woodstock. We played Woodstock, uh, and, yeah. and it was five hundred thousand people. I'd yeah. never played in five hundred yeah. that many people. Yeah. I was oh, she she could take she, an audience, and a lot of people didn't survive ninety four Woodstock as far as their performances, mm -hmm. and it, they because they choked. Oh and, wow! And she she rose above. She don't choke. She had all the the mud people on acid yeah. loving her by the end, of, and we were playing between Henry Rollins and and Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> That's how it, yeah, and, and that's how good she was. She's that good. She, it, it, there's yeah. nobody like her. Her energy. So anyway, so her support of me, mm. all of a sudden my phone started ringing. It was like I was accepted. Like now you can produce other people. Oh. Now you can produce records. Now you're going to be the the, the go-to guy as a songwriter. And this was in the 90s. And because of that moment in my life, I've never stopped working. <laughs> So and, well, everybody and has that moment, that, and not that you we weren't working to get to that moment. Yeah. You know, I remember a story you told me that I'm gonna. I don't know if you told on your your channel yet. Is when you first were gonna do a session for Mellencamp, and it and you basically he came to you and said, "You're not ready." Yeah, I'm not on the and record. You're not ready. Yeah, and you wanted to play on the record. Yeah, and he said, "We're gonna bring in another guy to play on the record, yeah. so you should just stay home." And you, yeah. in your wisdom and, 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 and humility, said, can I come down and watch the other guy play? Because I want to learn. Yeah. Yeah. That's a life lesson. Well, dude, I was terrified to go home I, with my tail between my legs. And there was no No, way. but you went to him I and did. said, yeah, I'm not I going. might not be there yet in your eyes, yeah. but I will go there. Yeah and suck it up yep. and watch to see what that, cause I want what he has. Yeah. And, and, and that's about life. You gotta show up and you're gonna go, what is he doing? Oh, yeah. okay, okay. And if, if you hadn't done that moment, you wouldn't have been the, you know, the go-to guy like yeah. for Don was yeah. and all those, all yeah. those when you start playing on all those yeah. records and everyone's like, you know, and then you get to, uh, uh, Jack and Diane, <laughs> you yeah. know, you, you get, you know, all of a sudden, I want the guy who played that Phil. Yeah. How do we sample that snare yeah, drum? Yeah, 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 exactly. How do we get that guy? Because yeah. that guy's a powerhouse. Yeah. But you had to humble yourself. Yeah. And we've all been in those moments where you have to just eat crow, you know, um, and, and so is it, what is it, you know, preparation? And then, uh, it's getting poised, getting to that moment in your life where you, you've done all the, the woodshedding, the homework, and it's lonely, and you're in your room, and nobody cares, and you're doing it because you love it, yep. and you're playing on a Sunday night for four people, and you literally thank the audience to, for coming out, and you go, Bill, Stephanie, and you know, yep. you know everyone who's yeah. there, and everyone's like, oh, does Kenny really have it? No. Yeah. You know, I, I had that conversation with my parents. You know, that was a nice dream. Good for you. Yeah. Now what are you going to do? Now what are you going to do? Mm. Maybe you should go into TV editing. Maybe that's what you should do. And I was like, nope. Nope. <laughs> that's <laughs> when you know you're doing the right thing because you're, that's not because coming. Because you're doing it for yourself. And for your, from your heart. That's yeah. who you are. That's your essence. But that's why I connected with you because yeah. when you and I met, because we could talk about the personal side of this, yeah. is that you and I met and and to me you were like a long lost brother because yeah. we're band guys we we would sit in the back of the bus and go is this a band 
it's not really a band, is it? You know, it's her name on the marquee, but we really want to be, and we would, because we come from yeah. that mentality that we have a lot to offer and we care about what we're doing. And, and you supported me and, 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 and it was a lot of nurturing unconsciously from mm -hmm. you to me and to have you, it made me a better musician playing with you. Yeah. And, and I learned so much. I'm a little deaf in my left ear because of you, but I learned so much being in a yeah, room you're with on you. on that side. Yeah, my left ear. Well, that symbol, did, that one we did, symbol. We used to jam two hours a day before a three hour show. Yeah. You, me, and Mark. Yeah. Because we loved the music. Yeah. And, and we jam. would play like Wired and Zeppelin and, you know. But it's so important to have comrades and, and mentors and, yeah. and, and the irony that you and I bonded, uh, you know, on the field and off the field, and then the irony that your parents and my parents became friends at the end of their, in, in, in their life, at the end of their, both their lives, to in a sense, the last 15 years of their lives, yeah. you know, they would have dinners together because they lived in towns near each other. Yeah. And then your brother, which I never knew you had a twin. <laughs> I Kenny forget has, to tell people. Kenny has an identical twin. Yeah. Which is the famous story where there was a band that was going through Stockbridge or something and saw you walking down the Bonnie street. Bonnie Raitt's band. Bonnie Raitt's band. And they tackled your brother on the street. Yeah. And they were like, Kenny. And he's like, I'm not Kenny. They're like, shut up, you're Kenny. And he's <laughs> like, no, I'm John. And cut to my dad, who's in, uh, not hospice, but in um, a, a retirement, you know, uh, so assisted living. And uh, heard that my father was there, and that uh, he he was like Bob Shanks. Bob Shanks is here. What do you mean he's here? He, and they said, Oh yeah, he's in room seven. And he and he walked in the room, and he said, Hi Bob, I'm John. And my dad was just enough in a foggy state. He was like, No, you're Kenny. My son is John. He's like, No, I'm John. And my dad just didn't get it. He was thought like, I must be, you know, losing my mind because <laughs> he knew how close we were. And maybe he's seeing both, you know, is just simulating. And, yeah. and he was like, no, I'm Kenny's twin brother, John. And all I can tell you is that in the last eight months of my dad's life is your brother would see, because I couldn't get to my dad during COVID, yeah. is that your brother would visit my dad twice a week and FaceTime me. Yeah. And so when I couldn't see my dad, that was my only connection with my father in the, near the end of his life. And it was your brother who said, you should come. It's time. It's getting close. And, and really just helped me through an incredibly difficult period. And it just shows you that how it's all connected. You know? Well, you and I, it's insane. It's the, insane. But the love, the love of all that, you know, of your brother and you and your family and my parents and, yeah. you know, that we're on this journey together. It's incredible. Musical, musical personal, friend, personal, spiritually, as a friend, as a, as a co-pilot, you know, it's incredible. And, we, and you know, we're, we're going to keep going and going and going and going and going. Dude, man, I... That's like such a heavy story. I think this is a perfect place to say, yes, thank you for coming and doing this. Uh, dude, there's so much more I can talk to you about, but this has been great. John, <laughs> brothers forever. Yes. All right, thanks for doing you're this, lucky, man. Listen, you're lucky when you find people in your journey of life and some are clients and some are friends regardless of whether you're working with them or not and you are yeah. certainly one of them it's for me very few situations like that yeah well dude we're gonna keep doing this i mean I, what else are we gonna do i have no b plan there is no b plan this we're is past no plan. the b plan there is no b plan. this is more about maintenance yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just right. like you know be appreciative be grateful and carry on you carry know? on